You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freeb. Hello, guys. Hello, and we've, we've convened uh, unexpectedly, haven't we? We weren't going to give you a, a regular podcast this week, but uh, some big news in the world of cycling this week. Team Lotto NL Jumbo have expelled three riders from their training camp for possessing non-approved sleep medication. Did you see that? I no. Did, I did see that. Yeah. But it's it's uh, maybe maybe a good day to bury bad news for Lotto NL Jumbo. I don't know. Which three riders? Juan Jose Lobato, for one, Antoine Toluk, and Pascal Incorn, or Encorn. So there you go. A serious violation of the strict regulations of the team. But there has been other cycling news, hasn't there, this week, in a similar vein, no pun intended. Chris Froome reported adverse analytical finding from the Vuelta a España some months ago now, but it leaked and it was published in Le Monde and The Guardian this week on Wednesday. Lionel, can you just give us a kind of summary of what's happened? Chris Froome obviously won the Tour de France, won the Vuelta a España, and this case all centres around a test. A urine sample taken at the Vuelta after stage 18 to Santo Toribio de Liebana on September the 7th. Uh, Chris Froome has exercised induced asthma and uses the asthma medication salbutamol, which is permitted without a TUE, a therapeutic use exemption but only up to a limit of 1,600 micrograms in a 24-hour period. So basically, in layman's terms, that means uh, Chris Froome and other asthmatics competing in cycling can use salbutamol. However, in terms of the urine test, the World Anti-Doping Agency's threshold for salbutamol is 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. And Froome's test on that particular day showed a concentration twice that of 2,000 nanograms per milliliter. Now, Richard, you used the phrase adverse analytical finding, and that's important because at the moment this is not a positive dope test, but it is something that Chris Froome and Team Sky have to take very seriously, and it could result in a ban. There is precedent for that, and we will talk about that a little bit later on, but we are currently in the position where Chris Froome has to explain to the UCI how the elevated levels of salbutamol got into that particular sample. It is worth pointing out that none of the other tests we gather at the moment, or taken at the Vuelta, require any extra explanation. So Chris Froome has come out and said that this is not a doping case, as of course Team Sky and Chris Froome would say, but coming on the back, all the controversy about the the TUEs and Bradley Wiggins last year, this is another case where we are solidly in the middle of the grey areas, I would say. Indeed. I I guess one of the the questions that people have is, would we ever have known about this had the Guardian and Le Monde not published the story, not gone to the UCI, having uh, been fed the information that that this had happened with Froome? Froome himself has known since uh, the, the, the day of the World Time Trial Championship, where, of course, he won a bronze medal behind Tom de Moulin. Which is, which is remarkable, and some of you will have listened this week to our first Friends special of 2018, which with exquisite timing, at home with the Frooms, uh, Orla interviewed Michelle Froome, I interviewed Chris Froome, uh, and this episode <laughs> was released just uh, hours before this, this news broke. But we spent you know three or four hours with them in Monaco on October the 11th, so a few weeks after this happened, and... Uh, they both appeared very, very relaxed. I mean, they didn't didn't seem to have a care in the world. And I, I always find it remarkable that athletes are able to, I don't know, um, compartmentalize or certainly carry on as if as if nothing's going on. And and I don't know how Froome has been able to to do that. This is a huge thing hanging over him. There's no guarantee that it would be resolved. But a lot of people uncomfortable are they not, with the fact that it's only been made public thanks to some journalists on those newspapers. That is true, Rich. I mean, you said um, a lot of people are asking the question, would we have ever known? Well, we wouldn't because um, Sky 
uh, had no intention of releasing any information about this, neither did the UCI, although in these cases the UCI are at liberty to confirm if an allegation is put to them that a rider has returned an adverse analytical finding, they're at liberty to confirm the identity of the rider, um, but they are, are under no obligation um, within their kind of statutes, their rules, to of their own initiative announce that uh, a, a rider has had this happen to them which might make people uncomfortable. I think Tony Martin got slightly the wrong end of the stick. Um, the Katuja rider, Tony Martin, has come out and said that, um, you know, it, it's well, he suggested that it's wrong or scandalous that Froome was able to carry on competing and that the this was all happening behind the scenes. In in these cases, that's, that's perfectly legitimate, as I understand it. What is interesting is that um, there has been no provisional suspension of Chris Froome either by the team or the UCI. The UCI don't have to suspend Chris Froome provisionally in these cases, although it's a positive A and B sample that he's returned already. Um, But the team could have. And why would they have done that? Well, if Chris Froome does get banned, his ban will start on the date of the announcement of the sanction. Um, In previous cases, bans have been backdated and they've started from the moment when the rider or the team have suspended the rider or the rider has suspended him himself. I mean, that happened last year with Simon Yates when um, he had, well, he also tested positive for a an asthma medication that should have been justified by a TUE. He had the TUE, but um, they'd forgot to in- include it on the anti-doping form or they'd, they'd forgot to specify the substance. But he suspended himself straight away, and which was to his advantage later on because um, he'd effectively almost served his ban by the time the sanction was announced. In Chris Froome's case, um, you know, we, this might go on, this whole process of him trying to explain why he'd gone over the salbutamol threshold might go on for several months, at which point, after several months, the UCI might um, announce that he's banned. And, um, you know, if you look at the dates and the timeline and you just kind of speculate, looking at previous cases, how long a ban could be. Um, if it was six months, for example, or well, six months from yesterday was the 13th of June. So obviously just before the Tour de France. Um, this case, I don't think is going to be resolved in the next two weeks. So if, for example, the UCI um, announced in a month that, that Chris Froome's ban was going to be six months, then he would not be eligible to ride the Tour de France. Um, another possibility, look again, looking at how long these cases have taken in the past is that we get to the Giro d'Italia next year or the Tour de France next year and he's still not provisionally suspended by Sky and he's still not suspended by the UCI and he can compete and start in those races and we obviously get a we get a, a pretty unsatisfactory situation like we've had in the past with Alberto Contador who who rode a, a Giro d'Italia and won a Giro d'Italia with the threat of a ban hanging over him and that ban was subsequently confirmed and he was stripped of the results. So um, I don't think anyone really wants that to happen. And there's the, the Chris Froome and his, uh, his entourage have been given no cl- clear timeline on how long this process might take. It could take weeks, it could take months. Is I mean, the process. Am I not right in thinking that the process is in the hands of of Froome and his entourage? It's it's up to him now to um, to demonstrate how it, such elevated quantities of subbutamol were in his body. It, it's not. It's a. It's kind of the opposite of a, you know, under strict liability with anti doping case with positive tests. Um, the athlete has to prove uh, that there's an assumption then of of guilt. You know, the athlete has to prove this is the opposite. Yeah, that's exactly right, Rich. And, you know, the, the problem that Froome has got is that, as I understand it, he has a quite a sort of strict regimen of when he takes um, his asthma medication and different kind of levels of, of, of how much he needs to take. And th- this is, if, if you like, the sort of the top level of uh, on that particular day, he took um, the most he would ever take. But that was not the only day in the Welsh or was not the only day, for example, last season or, or in his career when he's taken that amount of um, his inhaler. Um, but you've got this this huge outlier, this one result, every other result we presume was under the threshold, and this one result which is way over the the limit. But now he's in the position where he has to prove why that was. It's not enough to say to the UCI, well, something must have something must have gone wrong here, either with the test or, you know, with my metabolism. They have to say what went wrong. Sky or team um, Chris Room have to prove what went wrong and why it went wrong. And um 
you know, where do you start with that? They, uh, you know, just looking back at previous cases, and we'll talk later about the Alessandro Pataki case, I think, and unless there's, they can provide a very, very detailed um, explanation of exactly why there was that amount of salbutamol in his urine, it might not cut any ice with, with the UCI's doping tribunal. You should just point out, going back to the Vuelta, and, and I remember, well, I arrived back on the race at Chris Froome's press conference, um, which was on the rest day, the final rest day of the race. And, you know, there was a there was a bit of kind of um, gossip at the time about whether or not um, Froome was, was coughing more than normal. And it does appear, uh, certainly in um, Froome and Team Sky's initial reactions to this news becoming public, uh, they're, they're saying that his asthma symptoms were worsening during that period. And, and it is important to point out that, you know, they have said that they increased the um, the amount of salbutamol um, that Froome was taking in consultation with the, the Team Sky doctor, but they maintain, Froome maintains that he didn't exceed the permitted dose, um, the, you know, the amount allowed by the World Anti-Doping Agency's rules. And so you're absolutely right, Daniel, this is going to hinge on um, that bit of science between taking the, the dose of the medicine and the, the trace that shows up in a urine sample. And, and that will, I suspect, and I don't want to sort of speculate on the science of this because, well, I'm, I'm not a science, I'm not a medic, but it's going to hinge on you know, how, how the body absorbed and processed the substance on that particular day and why the result was different uh, and, and enough to trip the wire in this case and, and not... Um, on the other days so it's going to be uh, it's I would suggest a, a you're absolutely right a, a lengthy and and quite difficult um, case to get to the bottom of another thing that's worth pointing out Lionel perhaps is um, parallel with the Simon Yates case different substances slightly different um, circumstances however um, th- he was shown some clemency because it was acknowledged by the UCI doping tribunal that there had been an error on the part of the doctor um, the team doctor in question, um, he'd forgotten to specify a substance on the anti-doping form that, that Simon Yates was was allowed to take. In this case, nothing I've heard, read or, or seen suggests that Team Sky are going to throw a team doctor under the bus, as it were, and suggest that Froome was giving the wrong advice or the wrong dose um, by the doctor in that final week of the welter, thereby leading to him having a high concentration of salbutamol in his urine. Whoever you are, whatever you ride whatever the reason rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit inspiring stories and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world thank you very much to our main sponsor rafa for backing the cycling podcast all year um they enable us to produce these weekly free podcasts thank you very much them i mentioned at the start that we've also just launched our friends of the podcast uh, program for 2018 episode one is out the frooms at home unmissable and we have got we're going to actually release episode number two very very soon i think next week early next week lionel is that the plan i think so yeah why not why not Uh, yeah why not Mm. gives people something to listen to over christmas and that's going to be look lunch with matt white so we had lunch with matt white recently in london and a very very candid discussion indeed over an hour and uh i think it's a a really interesting listen covers his own career uh, as a writer and more recently as a sports director at Orica. Does he cover, Rich, his own positive test for... For salbutamol. For salbutamol, for salbutamol or adverse in, analytical in, finding. In 1998. He, he does. He, he got a two-month ban for that, is that right? He certainly covers his doping in a lot of detail. And uh, and at the the first Giro that he rode um, in 1998 as well, the Giro won by Marco Pantani, it's, it's really quite grisly at times, but fascinating and uh, really... A really good listen, I think. So that is released next week. You can become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. Fair to say that <clears throat> I think salbutamol was, was the very least of... I mean, amazing that he got done for salbutamol when with everything else that, that was doing at the time. But anyway, um, I guess we're going to talk about precedents, aren't we, in this part? You've been looking into that, Daniel. I mean, I contacted Jeroen Swart yesterday, the sports scientist in South Africa who's involved in anti-doping in South Africa, and he's he's worked with Froome before, of course, on the on the test that he did in the lab a few years ago. I, you know, I was keen to to know the answers to basic questions: Is salbutamol performance enhancing? Um, if you're taking salbutamol for asthma, does an increased dose bring extra benefits? 
Um, any way to take it other than by inhaler? Can it work in conjunction with any other drugs? Some of those answers became clear yesterday. It is listed in the WADA code as a potential masking agent, but um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of it being used as a masking agent. Um, Yeroen said that there have been a few studies that have shown performance enhancing effects, but those are balanced by a whole bunch of studies that show no benefit. I mean, the thing that struck him as, as most surprising, really, was the size of, of the, the quantity of subutamol in his system on that one particular day. Um, and Froome has given an interview today to Orla Shinoui about, about it all, and he has said that there have been no other occasions when he's been over the threshold for subutamol in his career. So one of the things we wondered was, you know, has this happened before and we've not known about it? You know, is it, is it quite a regular occurrence? We don't know. He certainly says that he has never had this happen before and that he's never taken subutamol in any form other than by inhaler. It's a really, really curious one. I mean, on the, you know, the the possibility of some strange reaction in his body, maybe dehydration, whatever. Yarun said it wasn't dehydration, but it's the lack of renal blood flow that can cause very concentrated urine that could perhaps um, produce a freak result like this. But again, you know, Sky monitor their riders' levels of dehydration very closely. You know, there was that story a couple of years ago of from of a, a, a from urine sample being found outside a hotel door, wasn't there? So they would know, um, you know, certainly daily, at least daily, the state of their riders' hydration. So they must have, you would think, records of all that as well. Well, just on that, Rich, we were going to talk about precedents. And um, one case that was very extensively documented um, was the Alessandro Pataki case in 2007. He had a similar sort of adverse analytical finding, slightly less salbutamol in his system, 1,300 and something nanograms um, as opposed to for him 2,000 with the, the threshold being um, 1,000 and um, just on the, the the question of you know the concentration in the urine one of the arguments that Pataki made and he was originally absolved and then um, that decision so he was absolved by his own federation and that decision was contested by um, his National Olympic Committee, so Kony and WADA, um, and and his defence team, Pataki's, um, suggested that what should have been taken into account was something called the specific urine gravity, um, urine specific gravity. Now, this is very uncomfortable for me because anything to do with toilets and, <laughs> um, is is always tough for me to talk about but um that is basically <laughs> the 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 ratio of um water in the urine he was told or in the summing up of the case when the decision was actually overturned and he did get a ban that wada uh, the wada code only stipulates that naturally the the specific urine um, gravity is only taken into account when the test is for endogenous so naturally produced substances and that it couldn't be taken into account in in this case and i mean the, the wider point from that again is that chris Froome is going to have to the burden of, of proving his innocence is all on him and his team um that the, he's not going to get any help here from the uci and their anti-doping tribunal and their scientific experts it's it's all it's all down to him and uh, to prove that there was that amount of subutamol in his urine for for good reason for a legitimate reason. So if we look at the previous cases, um, and you mentioned Alessandro Pataki there, Daniel, uh, that was back in 2007, wasn't it? Um, a test taken at the Giro d'Italia where he won several stages. Initially, he was stripped of those wins and then reinstated. And then the Court of Arbitration for Sport finally upheld the decision and he was stripped officially of those of those victories. Um, a more recent case, uh, another Italian rider, Diego Ulissi, um, again during the Giro d'Italia, this time in 2014, elevated levels of salbutamol. Again, not as high as Chris Froome's, I don't think. And he was suspended for nine months and, and stripped of results from that period. So obviously, if uh, Chris Froome and Team Sky can't demonstrate that they didn't exceed the dose, then we could be looking at a similar scenario, couldn't we? One thing I think that bears pointing out here is that in there was quite a big change in the way uh, the UCI administers its 
doping cases in January of 2015 when um, the the bodies deciding on the sanctions for athletes and effectively sort of processing the cases um, up until that point they were the national federations in every country and that's one of the reasons I think why you had so much variation between the sanctions um, that were given to different riders I mean Ulisi got nine months in the end but he was he had a Swiss license and it was the Swiss um, sanctioning body I, I'm not sure whether it's there it's the cycling federation or the Olympic committee but um he he got his sanctions there um from switzerland and um, with pataki it was italy and so forth since january 2015 um it is the uci's anti-doping tribunal that decides on all of the sanctions um now the uci didn't appeal the ulisi decision they didn't appeal to the court of arbitration for sport which suggests that they were roughly broadly in agreement with the sanction there it strikes me as being a fairly similar case the ulisi case similar quantity of salbutamol what will be different is that you would think that sky and Froome will have i'm not, not going to say better lawyers on the case but they'll have more robust kind of legal machinery behind this um, and the other big difference was that um, Lamprey Ulysses team suspended him provisionally straight away so again he was he ended up in the advantageous position where whereby he had um, served most of his ban by the time that he was actually sort of found guilty as it were and he didn't try to contest the decision he didn't go to the court of arbitration for sport if the UCI does ban Froome and he decides that he does want to go to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, there, I think, again, he's in, he's in a bit of an invidious position because Court of Arbitration for Sport uses a lot of, it, it bases a lot of its decisions on precedents and there's one very, very clear precedent that they've got with Pataki. And again, looking through his case, it doesn't make particularly comfortable reading for, for Froome, I wouldn't suggest. All of which makes it it's so surprising that Froome is a appeared at least from the outside to have been able to, to go about his business with a relaxed mind and, and and you know only only last week or two weeks ago he confirmed that he was going to the the Giro d'Italia next year in a video and uh, you know he certainly it seems to have been business as usual and, and training he's training Mallorca at the moment and planning for next year um as though he appeared quite unperturbed by it and, and unconcerned that there would be a, a punishment and a ban that that's that strikes a lot of people as odd i think i mean without straying into areas of speculation and, and trying to trying to second guess somebody's mindset i mean it could be explained by two things one um uh, as Daniel said, you know, they, they wouldn't have necessarily had an expectation that this would be made public. And secondly, you know, Chris Froome, he's got asthma, uh, exercise-induced asthma, how he describes it. He has uh, taken salbutamol for a long time. We think back to the tour of Romandie a few years ago when um, this, you, you know, he was he was riding in the front group and uh, the, the TV cameras picked him up, taking a puff on his um, inhaler that was a, a, a kind of almost a watershed moment certainly in terms of public perception because a lot of people thought well hang on a minute what's going on here um, and and I certainly learned a lot about um, you know asthma drugs and asthma in sport as a result of that my initial reaction was that this just looks this just looks terrible and then of course people um, working within sport saying well you know do we have do we create a, a, a place where Asthmatics cannot compete in sport, and that would be um, hugely damaging for a, a, a large number of people. Um, and so, you know, that was a, when this kind of whole complex area um, first certainly crossed my mind anyway, because prior to that, my perception had been, well, you know, ev everyone who's a registered asthmatic in sport, you know, that the cynic in me would say, this is crazy. I mean, how, how are all these asthmatics among the greatest um, sports people in the world? And so, that was something that certainly changed my perceptions of, of this. Um, but now we are in a position where, uh, you know, Chris Froome obviously feels that he has done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, but the certainly the reporting is uh, gives a very different impression. I mean, the, the headline on the BBC six o'clock news was as clear as day. It, Chris Froome has failed a drugs test. And, uh, you know, we can argue about the semantics of that. But that is the situation that we're in. And that is how it looks. And in terms of um, this fight, it's certainly not going to get any clearer uh, anytime soon. I suspect it will get um, 
it will get more difficult to understand before we reach a conclusion and get to an answer. Just just a little bit on that, Lionel. It was actually the, the Dauphiné ran to oh. Romandy um, where he was, Sorry, uh, yes, it photographed was. using the inhaler. Just on that, on the, the use of an inhaler in the race, um, this was something that, again, was in Pataki's defence that on the particular day when he tested positive, he tried to use his inhaler during the race and his defence team speculated that he could have... I, I don't really know how this would happen. I've never used an inhaler, but he could have swallowed some of the medication um, uh, instead of inhaled it um, as you normally would and they also said that um, not enough attention was paid in um, the arbitration of this case to to inhalation technique which could have a, a big effect on the amount of salbutamol in someone's urine and but again this was thrown out this was not accepted it was um, um, it, it, the, the the court of arbitration for support panel accepted that this might have happened but it was ultimately still Pataki's fault and uh, he bore strict liability. On the subject of the prevalence of asthmatics in sport and especially when you're talking about exercise and just asthma I've never been too surprised about that it strikes me that and, and you hear all the time that professional athletes contrary to the the myth that they are you know perfect specimens in, in, in incredible health all the time they're they're on the on the on the brink of illness and injury all the time um you know and, and the uh, i mentioned earlier when we were chatting that you know m footballers are more likely to have cruciate ligament injuries than general members of the population it strikes me that the stress and the strain that athletes are putting their lungs under means that there will be a greater incidence of of exercise induced asthma in in elite athletes and i think it's it's right about 20 percent, isn't it of of elite athletes have asthma of some kind and and to me, that that sort of makes sense, I think. Yeah, and, and Chris Froome has used an inhaler since he was a teenager, long before he became a, an elite and professional athlete. So, um, you know, it, it's a, uh, like I say, it's an, it's an uncomfortable area because um, the last thing we, we really want to be saying is that um, certain medical conditions are... Uh, prohibit you from taking part in elite sport um, you know, so it's a it's a very tricky case and uh, I think really when in the final analysis our colleague Francois Tomaso who always makes the point that that um, doping in sport is a legal matter rather than a um, than an ethical or moral one um, that the facts will decide the limit has been exceeded and um, the precedent is there as Daniel says and it will be up to um, Chris Froome and Team Sky to uh, argue their way to um, avoiding a suspension I suspect you were living a secret life you were and you had to hide things from loved ones and you had to hide things from from mates at home or because it's certainly not socially acceptable to use performance enhancing drugs and I, I think for me the biggest liberating factor I think when I did confess, end of 2012 there, I was really <coughs> thrown under the bus by the Australian media, which is fine. I take full responsibility for what I did. But I was, I was the first Australian in any of those sports who actually did say they were involved in any, any kind of doping. So it was a big story because Australians are very, very... Our moral standards with sport is very, very high. Same it is here in, in the UK that, you know, doping and, and professional sport or elite sport should not and ever mix. And I think Australians in general... We're very ignorant, really, to the fact that professional sport cannot always be a healthy place where there's people able to make lots of money, there's people willing to take risks. Unfortunately, that's human nature. I was on the back page of the biggest newspaper in Australia with drug cheat. That was the, I was the back page. Become a friend of the podcast and get at least 11 exclusive in-depth episodes for just £15. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com to sign up for 2018. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. And of course, as ever, you can get 20% off all your Science in Sport products at scienceinsport.com with the code CPAUG20. Thank you to them. Lionel, you mentioned Francois Tomazo. I mean, this is, it's so murky, this, it's so lacking in clarity and and you know the public and the media they like their doping stories to be very black or white similar to to the the perception that you know people are either good or evil and um, we, we like things to be simple um and this certainly isn't simple but francois thomas our colleague um 
does have a, a great way of cutting through the, the BS at times, doesn't he? And to quote his tweet this morning, and he has said this about a million times, doping is not about morals, it's not about health, it's not even about performance enhancement. It's about respecting rules. Did Chris Froome break rules in the past TUE cases? No. This time, yes. That's a a, a, a good way of, of to bringing some, some clarity, whether you agree or not. Francois has been always very firm in that view that doping is not a moral issue it's a legal issue and it's about it's about the rules and, and about you know a, applying the rules and uh, under his strict interpretation it would appear that Chris Froome whether he gained any kind of performance advantage or not has transgressed the rules well yeah Rich but it's also written in the rules that Froome has the right of kind of reply and de- indeed defense before um, he receives any kind of sanction and penalty I mean everyone is of course at liberty to feel what they want about this. But I think you do have to bear in mind that, as Francois says, the current anti-doping system is based on legality, not ethics. I mean, the only thing that matters here materially is the UCR's judgment on the case and and whatever happens after that as regards appeals. But just to bear that out, Sky and Free might actually end up on the right side of the sort of ethical divide here, but the wrong side of it legally. I mean, that's exactly what happened with Pataki. In their summing up, um, the Court of Arbitration for Support panel said that they were satisfied he wasn't a cheat but that that ultimately didn't matter and that a rule of of strict liability applied yeah again though uh, in terms of the, the rules i mean the the rules are there's two kind of parallel tracks to it aren't there there's the the dosage that you're not allowed to exceed which is 1600 micrograms and then there is the sam- the the trace of the substance in a urine sample which is not allowed to exceed a thousand nanograms per milliliter so and and obviously uh, people who know far far more about it than us have, have drawn up that rule based on uh, i would assume you know huge uh, a large number of cases um, and uh, have, have come up with those parameters for good reason. Um, so it could well be, as you would rightly say, Daniel, that Chris Froome may not have uh, exceeded the dose permitted, and, and that's what he says, and yet his sample exceeds the permitted trace allowed in, in the sample. So there is a, a real sort of complexity to this that, that he could well have stuck within the rules and yet has, has uh, fallen outside of the rules when, when, you, when you come to sort of evaluate things at the other end. So it, it's not a, not a simple case and it's not going to be a simple one to resolve, I wouldn't have thought. No, and, and how on earth can, can Sky explain, um, again, not to suggest that, that they up the dose um, to illegal levels, but um, they're in the difficult position where they have to explain why every other day or e- even on days when he took the same amount of this the substance that he's allowed to take and he was under the threshold and then suddenly he was, he was over it, um, he, was, he was double the limit. Um, and, uh, you know, they're going to submit a lot of documentation over the next few weeks, I think, but... Um, I think the last resort in these cases is something called um, pharm- pharmacokinetic testing or pharmacokinetic testing, whereby um, the rider will be possibly even um, in Egla at the UCI headquarters. They'll undergo a series of tests and they'll try to recreate the conditions he was um, he was riding in at that time. But you know, I imagine that that would be very diff- it would be very difficult to replicate you know, the exact weather conditions and um, the, the state of fatigue and so forth and so forth um, at the end, in the third week of a Grand Tour. And uh, as I say, I think that is a last resort for um, Froome and Sky, and they probably won't want it to go that far. Um, and if it, it does go that far, I would sort of suggest they're in a pretty bad position. Just to contradict Francois, but who says it's not about performance enhancement, but you know, for, for most of us, Doping equals performance in enhancement. It's about trying to get an unfair advantage, and and that is central to this as well. You know, would the subutamol have given Froome an unfair advantage? Would he have deliberately taken more of it to to try and gain an unfair advantage? Um, it 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 doesn't stack up. Well, my argument about that is always the same. I mean, if you're, I, it is, it's, and this is where it's so difficult when it comes to a medical condition. I mean, for, let's take a, a completely unrelated issue. Um, you know, if you have a, if you have a knee injury and you can't bend your knee, and then you can take a, a you know, 
cortisone and then suddenly can bend your knee um well, on the one hand that is restoring your knee to full extension and and what have you and restoring you back to to health um so you can carry on cycling on the other hand it's enhancing your performance from a position where you can't even pedal to a well, position it's ena- where you enabling can your pedal. performance it's but, enabling yeah. your performance of course uh, it's enabling yeah uh, okay but that's it, the gray area yeah, right there good, isn't it that's a, that is the gray area isn't it because enabling it that and that is the kind of the holy grail of all sports people isn't it and we've said this so many times on the podcast the holy grail is to be able to compete at their top level every day and they kind of know intuitive intuitively and in, in this area of, era of sports science they know down to the numbers what their maximum performance is and anything that compromises that performance whether it be illness or injury or what have you is almost seen as kind of like well that's that's inhibiting me and and that is uh, holding me back and of course the flip side to that the, the great contradiction of the grand tours is that the whole purpose of it is who comes through the best, who survives the best, who is almost the you know the last man standing, who can cope with the adversity and the a test of health, a as test said, of health, exactly. As we've said many times. But the related point is that the ease with which subutamol can be detected in urine. So, if Froome had deliberately overdosed on subutamol, he would have done so knowing that he was going to be tested and knowing that that as Jeroen said that it would be found it would be in his in his words career suicide that's what doesn't doesn't make sense no and it, it strikes me as a very contentious issue the whole salbutamol issue and something that um, might well be re- revised on the back of a what is going to be a very high profile case like this one i mean even going back to um the the mid 90s and with miguel indurain when he had an adverse well, I, I think it was called a positive test back then or they called it a positive test for salbutamol in the, at the Tour de Loise and the UCI's rules said that um, salbutamol weren't there wasn't banned and then the French Federation rules says, said that it was and um, that was very contentious again and um, it, it seems to me to be a bit of a murky area. So what, what does it mean for Team Sky Lionel? Oh, it's very difficult for Team Sky I mean of all the teams that um, that, that would face this they are the best equipped probably to to um, answer the case I mean we talked a bit about Diego Ulissi and Lamprey um, you know a smaller team would perhaps not have the financial legal um, wherewithal to take this all the way which you you imagine just from the way that Froome and Sky have, have set out initially I mean that Daniel makes a great point they, they haven't you know they, they haven't suspended Chris Froome or said that he won't you know they, they will carry on as normal um, while this case goes on in the background and uh, uh, so in in terms of the the team best equipped to to um, deal with this Sky are probably the best team equipped to deal with it um, but in terms of perception and um, you know the, the the public image of the team I think already we've seen on social media people who think that um, Sky stray over the lines and uh, you know use the previous cases the Bradley Wiggins TUE even Sergio Henao and the, the biological passport um, discrepancies or irregularities that had to then be researched and, and then Henao was cleared and, and returned to racing you know there's a for some people there is a, a kind of a, a, a greater pattern here um, and uh, I think that um, you know, I, I don't blame people for uh, looking at this and, and joining all these cases together and, and thinking it's just, you know, it's just uh, uh, it's just kind of the cost of doing business for Team Sky. But you made a great point, Daniel, before we started recording, when we were chatting about this, about, you know, that, that when it ever anything like this comes up with Team Sky, we always we, we hold them to a higher standard. And that's perhaps their own fault. But we probably have to move beyond that at some point well again it's this issue rich of uh, i mean i i get i don't um i don't claim that anyone should should react or feel a certain way about any of this i just know that from from my point of view and from our point of view uh, as people have been covering this for a very long time now um it's difficult to get too het, het up when you've come from an era and come from a world when people were talking about you know doing three blood bags in a Tour de France and EPO and and so forth and so forth um, it, it's quite difficult to wring your hands about an asthma medication and also you kind of brutalise you just you know you know that teams come and go riders come and go eras come and go but the whole circus sort of 
um, it, it rolls on. And, and I suppose as part of that, when Team Sky launched and when they made all these grandiose promises about being very clean and very transparent, um, I suppose people um, maybe like you, you and I um, took that less seriously than the kind of general sports media or general fan who would who had not been watching cycling so closely for for you know the previous decade or two decades and um you know we and also very quickly within a year two years sky sort of transitioned in my eyes and in the way they behaved and in everything about them into a normal team um they they were no longer or they if they ever had been this team that came onto the scene in the same way that for example slipstream did and um, making transparency and being clean and um, never having any kind of issue of this nature their usp um but but some people obviously do still consider them to have made that promise and and to and some people still obviously hold them to that promise I think we, we kind of move from a, maybe this is optimistic or naive perhaps, but we've moved from a doping model to a medical model, haven't we? Correct. And Correct. and it's it's not, you know, professional sport is highly medicalized. Um, and that might inevitably bring athletes close to that, that line. Um, you, you know, this is a whole other, other debate w- which we've had um, quite often and no doubt we'll have it again. Um, but I think that the, the, the at the moment, the the murkiness of this, the fact that it's not likely to be resolved anytime soon, leaves us all feeling pretty uncomfortable. And especially if we if we go to the Giro next year and Chris Froome is there and the case is, is unresolved, really echoes of 2011 when Contador was in the same situation and you know went to the Giro, won the Giro, went to the Tour de France, and all these all these results, all these performances were eventually. Um, wiped from the record books and uh, we don't want that situation again uh, but it's with a sense of dread that we we can sort of anticipate it I think just as a, as a last word Rich again you know the point about legality and not morality um, is is a, a valid one um, unfortunately this is a we live in an, a kind of adult world and this is and it's a complicated um, it's a very complicated sport and these are complicated rules and and um, you know the, our reactions to it almost have to mirror how nuanced these cases are and you know when I see things like yesterday reactions like oh that, I'm done with professional cycling that's it for me well um, I think if you if you do react in that way you're going to continue to be upset if you do keep watching it because you know these cases are going to come and go and uh, again like I said uh, teams are going to come and go eras are going to come and go disciplinary cases are going to come and go and um, you have to have a pretty thick skin to follow this sport you do shall we leave it there we'll we'll be back next week Lionel Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Rich. Are, are we going to put the Cassilay podcast out at any point, or is that is that got to go? Yeah, on next the... week. Next okay, week. Good. Well, Cassilay, Cassilay for Christmas. Brand. What, what before, were Lionel's? I'm... How many nanograms of duck fat were in Lionel's last <laughs> urine sample? Oh, he was way over the <laughs> well over the. Yeah, I, I mean, it you. wasn't measured in nanograms; yeah. it was measured in pints, Daniel. Well, yeah, we've got Cassilay next week, and also the Matt White episode, which on this subject of these different eras and how things have, have changed is is really interesting too. So I recommend that. Um, for your Christmas listening we've got an episode of the cycling podcast Femina coming out next week as well so a busy week Um, but for the moment thank you very much Daniel thank you thank you Lionel thank you Rich